Coming up on Arirang News, President Moon Jae-in announces a plan to grow the biohealth industry. More than $3 billion in investment through 2025 with the goal of tripling Korea's market share. A state-run think tank lowers its growth forecast for the Korean economy this year to just 2.4 percent. That's lower than the BOK and the finance ministry. To blame, it said, are falling investment and exports. And with the U.S. relenting somewhat on its blacklisting of Chinese tech giant Huawei, the Chinese government says it's ready to resume the talks on trade. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to our afternoon newscast. I'm Devin Whiting. North Korea's top envoy to the United Nations has again called for the U.S. to quickly return a North Korean cargo ship seized on suspicion of violating international sanctions. The ambassador blasted Washington on Tuesday for what he called an unlawful and outrageous act. E.G. Won has more. North Korean ambassador to the U.N. Kim Song held a rare news conference at the United Nations headquarters in New York on Tuesday, calling Washington's seizure of the North Korean cargo ship wise honest unlawful. The United States has committed unlawful and outrageous the act of dispossessing our cargo ship wise honest by forcibly taking it to the American Samoa under the pretext of unilateral sanctions and violation of its domestic law. We are condemning in strongest terms this act of dispossessing of our cargo ship. Earlier this month, the U.S. Justice Department announced it has seized a ship suspected of violating U.S. domestic law and international sanctions by making illicit coal transfers and the first direct seizure of a North Korean ship by American authorities. The ship was previously detained by Indonesia in April 2018 and has now been moved by the U.S. to American Samoa. On Tuesday, North Korea's top envoy to the U.N. called for the immediate return of the ship. Therefore, the United States should deliberate and think over the consequences of its outrageous act might have on the future development. Also, the United States must return our cargo ship without a delay. The latest demand by Kim comes as he sent a letter to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres last week, in which he criticized the unilateral U.S. sanctions as going against the UN Charter and international law. The UN said it shared a document with the Security Council and member states, adding that questions concerning sanctions on North Korea are for the member states to address. In response to North Korea's press conference, a U.S. State Department official says international sanctions remain in place and are to be enforced by all U.N. members. The U.S. official was quoted in a Voice of America report and added that President Trump believes North Korean leader Kim Jong-un will fulfill his commitment to denuclearize. The official also said the U.S. remains open to diplomatic negotiations with Pyongyang to make further progress on that goal. South and North Korean civic groups are set to meet this week for the first time since the North Korea-U.S. summit in Hanoi. That's according to the South Korean committee set up to carry out the agreements of last year's June 15th declaration. The committee and two South Korean civic groups will meet with their North Korean counterparts in the Chinese city of Shenyang. They're expected to discuss joint projects, the repatri repatriation from Japan of the remains of Koreans forced to work there during Japan's colonial rule of Korea, and the provision of humanitarian aid to the North. The meeting was requested by the North Korean Committee in a letter in which it called for cooperation on ways to achieve peace and prosperity. Japan's foreign ministry has rejected the validity of a lawsuit filed in South Korea demanding compensation for Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women and girls before and during World War II. Japan's Kyoto News reported Tuesday that Japan informed South Korea through a diplomatic channel that it does not accept South Korea's jurisdiction in the matter and that the case should be dismissed. A total of 20 South Korean victims and their families filed a lawsuit against the Japanese government in 2016, demanding legal compensation for their emotional and physical pain. Hearings have yet to begin. 
Japan argues that it had already reached a final agreement on the matter with South Korea's previous government in 2015. Tomorrow marks the 10th anniversary of the death of former South Korean President No Mu Hyun. To commemorate his life, many are visiting Bongha Village, where the liberal president was laid to rest. Our Park Hee Jun reports from Bongha Village. It's been almost a decade since the passing of former President No Mu Hyun. No served as the 16th president of South Korea from 2003 to 2008. Now President Moon Jae-in was his presidential chief of staff and longtime friend. No took his own life while being investigated for bribery allegations in 2009. At Ponga village near Kime, Gyeongsangnam-do province, the late president's hometown and resting place, there are endless visitors who don't want to let go of his memory. I still can't believe it's been 10 years. I still have the memories from when he was alive. I came here to relieve some of my emotional burden. I still feel tears coming out. Commoners like us liked a world where we could say what we wanted to say. That was possible because we had someone like him. Even his private residence is full of visitors to mark the 10th anniversary. No used to greet guests a dozen times a day. Although he can no longer do so, the residence has been open to the public since May last year. Tracing his course of life at his home, I can experience what kind of life he lived. And to mark the 10th anniversary of his passing, a memorial service will be held here at his grave on Thursday the 23rd. Around 5,000 people are expected to attend a ceremony to remember and honor the late President No Mu Hyun. Among the attendees is former U.S. President George W. Bush, No's counterpart during his term. Prime Minister Lee nak and National Assembly Speaker Moon Hee-sang will also attend the event. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News, Kim Hye. President Moon has announced an ambitious vision for the country's biohealth industry. Today, he went to the Osong Bio Valley, just south of Seoul, where much of the nation's biotech research is done. And there, he promised billions of dollars worth of support to help build the sector. Shin Se-min reports. President Moon Jae-in says he's rolling up his sleeves to make the country's biohealth industry a global leader. Visiting Osong, Chungcheongbuk-do province, also known as the nation's heart of biotechnology research, President Moon announced his vision for cultivating the industry to account for 6% of the global market share and exports to hit 50 billion U.S. dollars by 2030. <laughs> Calling it a young industry, the president pressed the importance of R&D in the sector, saying that it will sway the success of the industry and the global market. And he promised full governmental backing in churning out talents and technical skills. R&D 연간 4조 원 이상으로 확대하고 스케일업 전용 펀드를 통해 향후 5년간 2조 원 이상을 바이오 헬스 분야에 투자하겠습니다. He added that the government will back the fostering of an innovative ecosystem by allowing SMEs and venture firms to develop their own technical skills and produce and release into the market. Most recently, Korea's push for upping its medical exports to the EU received backing by making it onto the pharmaceutical whitelist. The country is now being recognized as having medicine-related production and supervision standards on par with those of European member nations. The president's push for the industry is in line with his tour of regions, the ninth such kind aimed at enhancing economic vitality on the local level. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The South Korean government has announced that it will initiate procedures to ratify three key conventions of the International Labor Organization, including those on freedom of association and on forced labor. Labor Minister Lee Jae-gap made the announcement on Wednesday ahead of a planned revision to the labor law. He said the government plans to send a motion of ratification to the National Assembly. 
1991, Korea became an official member of the ILO and has since ratified four of the eight core ILO conventions. Two were on discrimination and the other two were on child labor. Now, a day after the OECD lowered its growth forecast for Korea by 0.2 percentage points to 2.4 percent, the nation's top government think tank also cut the local economic growth outlook for this year. Kim Hye-sung reports. The Korea Development Institute has lowered South Korea's growth outlook for this year to 2.4 percent, down 0.2 percentage points from its previous forecast last November. That's the same as the OECD's growth projection released on Tuesday, but lower than the Finance Ministry and the Bank of Korea's outlook. The KDI said in its economic outlook report Wednesday that on top of falling investment, declining exports is also weighing on the local economy. Global economic growth has slowed down rapidly, hurting Korea's export growth. The local economy relies heavily on exports. If exports fall, domestic demand will also be affected. The growth in exports has fallen for five consecutive months since last December due to falling chip exports and weakening demand from China. Between May 1st and 20th, exports fell more than 10 percent on year, making it likely the downward trend is set to mark a six-month streak. The KDI pointed to the ongoing U.S.-China trade dispute and a turnaround in chip exports as two key factors that could affect Korea's economic growth and forecast total export growth of 1.6 percent for 2019. It also forecasts domestic demand to slow down and facilities and construction investment to contract more than 4 percent this year on slowing semiconductor investment and falling demand in the housing construction sector. The think tank expected job growth for this year to record 200,000, up from 150,000 people last year, thanks to the government's job creation policies. The unemployment rate is forecast to stay similar to last year's at 3.9 percent. The KDI pointed to the side effect of the minimum wage hike and the 52-hour work week as short-term risk factors. It recommended an expansionary fiscal and monetary policy in the short run and strengthening the social safety net and raising productivity in the mid to long term to support the local economy. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. South Korean households' debt grew in the first quarter to 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars, but it was the slowest on-year rise in 14 years. The Bank of Korea says from January through March, household debt, including mortgages and credit cards, grew around 5 percent on-year. Household debt growth hit a record back in 2016 of 11.6 percent, but for nine straight quarters, it's been slowing down. The BOK attributed that to the government's tighter lending regulations and a slowdown in housing transactions. Chipmaker SK Hynix has ranked the highest among major South Korean companies for its management. The evaluation was conducted by corporate tracker CEO score covering areas such as sales, global competitiveness, investment and job creation. CEO score says the evaluation was conducted on the country's top 500 firms by sales. Hynix scored around 713 out of a possible 800 thanks to the company's explosive sales growth. Ranked second was Naver, followed by Samsung Electronics. No further trade talks are scheduled right now between the U.S. and China, but Beijing says it's willing to talk. Following the Trump administration's decision to let American companies keep doing business with Huawei for the next three months. Our Kim Dami has more. The Chinese ambassador to the U.S. has said Beijing is ready to continue the trade talks with Washington. In an interview on Fox News, Tri Tenkai said, China remains ready to continue talks with American colleagues to reach a conclusion, assuring the U.S. that their door is still open. However, he made sure to mention that the U.S. kept changing its mind and had abruptly backed away from some previous deals tentatively reached over the past year. The Chinese ambassador added that China is willing to purchase more products made in the U.S. Meanwhile, Google has put on hold its suspension of Android services to Huawei. According to Business Insider, the tech giant has provided a 90-day grace period, allowing software updates and security patches to existing models. This comes after the U.S. Department of Commerce decided on Tuesday to grant Huawei a license of 90 days to help existing customers. Previously, Washington had banned U.S. firms from doing business with Huawei without government permission. 
While the 90-day period relieved some panicking Huawei users, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce commented that the temporary general license will allow operators to make other arrangements and give the Commerce Department a space to determine the appropriate long-term measures for those who rely on Huawei products. Huawei declined to comment on Google's latest plans. Kim Dami, Arirang News. It's time now for a look at the global markets this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Hwang se Research Fellow at the Korea Capital Market Institute. Dr. Hwang, thanks for coming on today. Good, af- good afternoon. So stocks in New York overnight recovered somewhat, uh, the Nasdaq especially, on news that the Trump administration would give American companies some time to deal with the blacklisting of Huawei. What's happening there and in other markets? Uh, U.S. stocks closed higher Tuesday on news that the U.S. temporarily eased restrictions on Chinese telecom giant Huawei. The Dow ended 0.77 percent higher as Intel outperformed. The S&P 500 gained 0.85 percent with the tech sector jumping 1.2 percent. The Nasdaq advanced nearly 1.1 percent. Asian stocks were on shaky ground on Wednesday as earlier relief over Washington's temporary relaxation of curves against China's Huawei technologies failed to offset the deeper worries about the trade friction between the world's two largest economies. The Chinese markets, which have endured a volatile few months, started off on a cautious note. The Shanghai Composite Index was down 0.65%. Japan's Nikkei edged up 0.05%. South Korea's KOSPI rose 0.18%, while Costa Composite advanced 0.42% today. Well, with these trade tensions, uh, the Chinese currency is weakening and it's closing in on 7 yuan to the dollar, which would be a low not seen since 2008. The Chinese financial authorities saying they're going to do something, but it's continued to fall this week. What does this mean for the Korean currency? The yuan has weakened almost 3% this month after the United States hiked tariffs on Chinese goods. The Chinese central bank said last week it will ensure that the currency does not reach the 7 per dollar level in the intermediate term. The yuan's recent slide risks reigniting one of the U.S. President Donald Trump's favorite criticism of China that Beijing weakens its currency to aid exporters. While analysts say the exchange rate is being driven by uh, soaring market sentiment as China's economy slows and the U.S. ramps up tariffs, the slide toward seven against the dollar comes during crunch trade negotiations. The decline in the value of the yuan is likely to lead a depreciation of Korean won, as China accounts for one quarter of Korea's total exports. The depreciation of the yuan may soon give deep impact on the value of Korean won. Well, here in Korea, uh, the OECD has lowered the growth forecast for the economy yet again from 2.6 down to 2.4 percent for this year. Why is that, and what's the prognosis for this weakness in GDP growth? Um, OECD said in its latest economic outlook over Korea that the Korean economy shows signs of sluggishness as exports fell amid slowing growth in domestic demand. Asia's fourth-largest economy expanded 2.7 percent in year 2018, down from a solid 3.1 percent the previous year. The escalating trade frictions between the United States and China would have a negative effect on the South Korean economy. The U.S. and China account for a combined 40 percent of South Korea's exports. South Korea's export fell 2% on year to 49 billion US dollar in April, extending their on year decline for the fifth consecutive month due to a protracted slump in chips and weak demand from China. The government needs to 
seek an expansionary fiscal and monetary policy to secure economic stability by preemptively responding to weak demand at home and abroad. All right, got it, Dr. Huang. We'll have to leave it there, though. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. In other news, British Prime Minister Theresa May has set out a new deal for Britain's departure from the European Union. She says it's the only way that Brexit can get done. So what's so new about the deal? Our Hong Yu reports. This is the British Prime Minister's fourth attempt to get her Brexit plan through Parliament and to try and get this deal across the line. She offered Parliament some sweeteners, including the chance to vote on whether to hold a second referendum. She laid out the details during his speech in London on Tuesday, but despite her describing the plan as having, quote, significant further changes, it's not all new. For example, the withdrawal agreement, which includes the backstop plan for the Irish border, remains exactly the same. But this time, May has offered the prospect of a parliamentary vote on holding a second referendum, pledges on workers' rights, environmental provisions, and a vote on a temporary customs union. With the offer, May also warned that anyone voting against her latest plan risks losing Brexit altogether. And only by voting for the withdrawal agreement bill at second reading can MPs provide the vehicle Parliament needs to determine how we leave the EU. So if MPs vote against the second reading of this bill, they are voting to stop Brexit. But even after her speech, significant opposition could be observed among lawmakers. The SNP and Tory Brexiteers have already said they will vote against it. Jacob Rees-Mogg, a Conservative MP and leader of a pro-Brexit bloc and the Prime Minister's party, said, quote, the Prime Minister's proposals are worse than before and that it would leave the UK bound deeply into the EU. May will propose a withdrawal agreement bill in the House of Commons in the first week of June, and this is likely to be May's last proposal as she faces increasing pressure to quit. Hong Yu, Arirang News. South Korea is well known as a destination for so-called medical tourism. Most come for plastic surgery, but it's expanding to all kinds of things, even traditional Korean medicine, as our Che Si Young reports. Roughly 400,000 medical tourists came to South Korea for procedures last year. While most came for plastic surgery, about 22,000 people came to avail of Korean medicine, marking the second highest increase of foreign patients annually. Among the most popular treatments is acupuncture, which is believed to stimulate blood flow and help the body heal. In addition to acupuncture treatment, many foreign patients come here for tuna treatment, a traditional Korean way of correcting a patient's spine. Tuna looks similar to physical therapy done by Western therapists, but is different in that the doctors practicing Korean medicine gently apply pressure to specific points of the spine to restore balance to the body's bones. I'm totally satisfied. I regularly come to the hospital for the treatment, and every time I receive it, I feel better. The effect of the treatment is noticeable. Patients say they heard about the Korean medicine from their family and friends. Some say they chose Korean medicine over Western because they were skeptical of their local hospitals. In Mongolia, local doctors recommended surgery, and my family was worried. But I heard that Korean medicine offers ways to soothe the pain. So I came to receive the treatment here. Now I'm satisfied and thankful. Korean doctors aren't the only ones who practice the ancient tradition. The language barrier is much more easy to be overcome and uh, I do understand the Western people way of thinking yeah? so I can explain as they can understand and yeah? not the Korean way but let's call it an international way of explanation so it's for them much more easier to understand what I, I mean yeah? and then it's more easier to follow the treatment. Yeah? The number of foreign patients coming to Korea has been on the rise for almost a decade now, and it seems those seeking out Korean medicine as an alternative to surgery is also likely to continue to increase. Choi Xiong, Arirang News.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thanks for being with us. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.